every kind of system that gets drunk on debt goes to centralization, currency debasement, and war. But the article I wrote today that comes out tomorrow is literally titled Global Snapshot stupid broken and evil the evil being the final opportunity the financial system is stupid the bond market is broken the last checkbox we have to distract us completely and take the blame off our politicians is war and that is one place done again where you're watching silver news daily subscribe for more did you know silver prices are on the verge of skyrocketing yes while everyone's watching gold silver is quietly positioning itself for a massive breakout with global tensions escalating and central banks piling up silver reserves, some experts are predicting silver could hit as high as $1.50 an ounce and soon. But how is this even possible? Stay tuned, because in today's video, we'll break down exactly why this silver rally is coming. And trust me, you don't want to miss what Matthew Piepenberg has to say about it. It's just as political as any other branch of the four branches of our government now. You can't listen to what they say. You look at what they do. And frankly, um, you know, throwing in the towel and, and cutting rates when rate, higher rates were supposed to be the fight against inflation and throwing in the towel before they hit target inflation is just a way of saying America can't afford rising rates to fight inflation. We couldn't do it much longer, so we caved. But inflation, as I've said many times, is the end game no matter what. If they kept rates higher and didn't cut, we still would have had inflation because that's the classic fiscal dominance argument that if you raise rates too high, then Uncle Sam's bar tab gets higher and higher. And the only way to pay for that is to print more money, which is inflationary. And if you don't uh, raise rates and you cut rates, well, that is also inflationary. Um, and so this really is uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Inflation's here to stay. That doesn't mean we can't have disinflationary or even deflationary moments if the markets mean revert, even though they're effectively subsidized by the Fed. If markets mean revert, or we have and we are going to be, and I think we're already in a recession that is highly disinflationary, and raising the Fed funds rate from zero to five and a quarter or five and a quarter plus in a short amount of time is inherently deflationary or disinflationary. But the end game will always be we're in debt up to our ears. We're going to have to cover the delta between tax receipts and GDP, which isn't enough, uh, with something that will be money mouse clicked out of nowhere, and that is inherently inflationary. So we can have disinflationary or deflationary moments, but America is looking a long road of inflation, weakening dollar to cover and monetize our debts. And again, and I'll stop here, Keep it simple, stupid, and instead of getting into all the complexities, especially as, the, as we start, when we took away the gold chaperone from the dollar, that meant you could create as many as you wanted, whatever politician, red or blue. In 1971, when we did that, our uh, debt to GDP was 38%, and our government debt was uh, 426 or $425 billion. Well, you take away the gold standard and look at where we are today. Our debt to GDP is 125%. And our government debt is 35 plus trillion. That's not a coincidence that our debt levels and our and our money supply levels have gone exponentially to the irrational uh, since we lost that chaperone and since politicians were able to overpromise and underdeliver by buying votes, buying a Nobel Prize for Bernanke, and buying time by going deeper into debt, issuing more and more IOUs, kicking the can to the next generation, and ultimately to Main Street in the form of inflation. Uh, and then blaming the the consequences on something else, whether it's Putin, global warming, COVID, et cetera. The real, the real sin is in the bathroom mirror of these policymakers. And so that's where we are. We're now in an inflationary policy. And, uh, you know, more liquidity just means uh, more debased uh, dollars. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see an easy way out of that. Even if we say, if I say again, even if we have a disinflationary event like a recession, um, right now, the world is sitting on a geopolitical powder keg. Just recently, tensions in the Middle East exploded with Iran launching over 200 ballistic missiles at Israel. As conflicts escalate, investors around the globe are scrambling for safe haven assets, and silver is right at the center of that demand. Unlike gold, silver has this unique advantage. It's not just a precious metal, but also a crucial industrial commodity. This dual role makes it even more attractive during uncertain times. But here's the kicker. While most eyes are on gold, silver is quietly gaining momentum as a hedge against geopolitical instability. Iran and Israel's ongoing tensions, paired with retaliatory threats from both sides, are driving safe-haven flows 
pushing silver prices up. Historically, whenever global tensions flare up, silver benefits, and this time, it's no different. Could these ongoing conflicts propel silver past its recent highs? That's what's got the markets buzzing. Big talk at the conference I was at in Vancouver in January. I said I thought it would probably be July or September. That doesn't mean I'm a genius. I just knew there'd be delayed and the rate cuts would come. Uh, I've been wrong on rate cuts. I thought there might have been a rate cut in 2023 when we had the banking crisis and that didn't happen. But this one, for many, really wasn't a shocker. Nothing happened in July. And so by the time September came along yesterday, many were saying it would probably be 50 basis points, which is exactly what it was. I think in a lot of ways, the markets have priced this in. I think the implications of it are, are, are far more obvious and far more predictable. It was always a matter of when, not if, the Fed would have to pivot toward rate cuts because it was really – it was a choice between saving the dollar and saving the system, and the system is the bond market, and the bond market really is the Fed's real mandate, not employment and uh, inflation, in my opinion. And so uh, there's a number of reasons why this was simply inevitable. Um, again, not a nail biter. Uh, at the end of the day, the dollar had to be sacrificed for a number of reasons. One of the most obvious, done again, is just the fact that uh, you know, there's about $15.5 trillion in U.S. Treasuries that have to be rolled over in the next three years. And that's a lot of money in a short period of time that has to be refinanced at, at the government level for Uncle Sam. And, um, you know, the coupon, which is the sticker price for those Treasuries, had an average weight of about 2%, 2.3%. But because of the higher for longer policy under Powell and the raising rates and the price pressure that put on bonds, the actual true interest expense, the yield was 5.3. So that's double the coupon. So that's an expensive and painful bill. Uh, the Uncle Sam literally couldn't afford Powell's policies. Um, so this rate cut was, again, somewhat inevitable. It was really too expensive for Uncle Sam. It's also too expensive for foreign markets and everyone else. But, you know, it's also, I think, done again, the, the, the pivot to the rate cut and the soon-to-be pivot from QT to QE is just Powell's way of admitting, without saying it out loud, that his war on inflation was lost. We didn't hit target 2%. They may have retargeted inflation for 3%, and that might have saved a little face. But look, if to your point, if things are going so well and the markets are great and labor is great and employment's great, why do we need a 50 basis point cut uh, going into an election cycle at the end of the year? So, again, not a huge shocker, but it's, it's the classic bipolarity of what the Fed does versus what it says. Fed As geopolitical tensions heat up, there's another major factor that's quietly working in Silver's favor, U.S. Federal Reserve policies. Recently, the Fed hinted at a potential rate cut, leaving many wondering what this could mean for Silver. You see, higher interest rates make holding non-yielding assets like Silver less attractive to investors. But as the possibility of rate cuts looms larger, the opportunity cost of holding silver is dropping fast. What's even more important is inflation. The Fed may be signaling that inflation isn't going away anytime soon, and inflation eats away at the value of the dollar. As the dollar weakens, investors start flocking to tangible assets like silver to preserve their wealth. With inflation sticking around and rate cuts on the horizon, silver is becoming a safe bet against the devaluation of cash. This is why experts are eyeing silver as a smart hedge, not just against market instability, but against a weakening U.S. dollar itself. Question, because, I mean, historically, I mean, in 2018, uh, you know, Powell, to his credit, did try to take away the punch bowl. He did try QT while he was raising rates at the same time, and that ended by 2019. In a disastrous December, Christmas, if we remember those 12, you know, 12 percent moves and 100, you know, thousand basis point moves in the markets, huge panic. Within a few months of that, we had the COVID crisis and unlimited QE. It buys time. Uh, to Luke Roman's point, you can, you can subsidize through QE or through rate rate cuts like this, and it can last for years, or it can end uh, tomorrow morning because there's so many needles pointing at this debt balloon and this extend and pretend policy. But to answer your question, you can buy dips, you can save markets um, by providing immense liquidity or making the cost of debt cheaper by, by playing with rates or playing with the supply. You know, when you, when you have the power to affect the price and the, and the, and the supply of money, that has, it can have temporary effects to, to even Ernest Hemingway's point that can buy temporary prosperity. 
The problem is it's it's giving too many uh, martinis at the party, though. They can make you happier and happier and happier hour after hour after hour into the party. But at some point, those martinis, instead of becoming sources of happy buzz, become a source of uh-oh and, and, and hangover and sickness. And the real question now, and I don't think anyone can predict when uh, it becomes too much, when QE and rate cuts are no longer stimulative to the markets. Uh, but technically, and this is the truth of modern monetary theory, which, by the way, is neither modern nor monetary or a theory, the idea that you can print money to solve a debt crisis, technically, you can always – sustain the markets and you can always sustain the bond markets and keep yields under control with artificial liquidity but you will always do so at the expense of the currency and that's what von mises warned that's what david hume warned that's what anyone with a uh, i mean anyone who understands credit markets and yields and currencies knows that there's no such thing as a free ride uh politicians have tried to sell us a free ride since Bretton woods was repealed in 71 but now here's something most people overlook Silver isn't just a safe haven in times of crisis. It's absolutely crucial to the clean energy revolution. Silver plays a vital role in solar energy and electric vehicles, and as the world pushes towards decarbonization, the demand for silver in these industries is skyrocketing. In fact, silver is essential in solar panels because of its incredible conductivity. With governments across the globe investing billions into green energy, the demand for silver and solar applications alone is expected to rise by a staggering 170% by 2030. And let's not forget about electric vehicles. The average EV uses up to 50 grams of silver, and with electric vehicle sales growing at record rates, silver's role in this industry is only going to expand. This booming industrial demand is creating a silver squeeze, limited supply, rising demand. Combine this with geopolitical uncertainty and inflation, and you've got the perfect recipe for silver prices to shoot through the roof. The truth is, yes, technically, historically, you can buy time for the markets, you can buy time for bond yields, you can buy time for extend and pretend, but you cannot do that without suffering some consequence, and the consequence that we are suffering and we will continue to suffer is the debasement of the money in our wallets, the money in our portfolios, the way we measure our wealth in just the last four years, uh, because inflation is a rate of change, not a rate of price change. Uh, we've lost over 25%, 24% of the purchasing power of our dollar in just four years. So when you add on that invisible tax of inflation with the higher interest rates that many Americans pay in credit cards and car loans or whatever debts they have, and then actual income taxes, again, it's not sensational. Uh, the middle class, the upper class, but the middle class feels it the most, they're basically running uphill in roller skates because their dollar is losing purchasing power um, because we have debased it. We have created too much of it in the broad money supply and not just through Federal Reserve mechanizations. Um, many people said, I would have rather had a recession than inflation. I would have rather had other things more honestly told to me than the destruction of my currency because that's death by a few cuts, not just a thousand. It's a slow frog boil. And regardless of the CPI scale, whatever that is, which is everyone knows is fiction, um, we all feel the loss of our purchasing power. Uh, we all feel uh, the pain of inflation. And so, yes, you can save the system historically and get quantitative empirical data that shows the markets are here, the yields are coming down, this or that is doing better. But if you measure it against the purchasing power of the dollar in your wallet, you're losing. And that's subtle, and that takes a little bit of nuance to understand. I think more and more Americans and citizens of the world are starting to understand that. Certainly, Eastern Central Banks understand that. Certainly, the BRICs understand that. Certainly, your listeners and ours uh, and our clients understand that. The question is, when does that become obvious to everyone? Um, and uh, you know, I think right now, Powell has said, and he said, yes, I'm not worried about inflation so much. I'm not worried about employment. Everything is strong. Yet in the same in the same series of sentences, he says that he's worried about employment and inflation. So you're getting word salad from our central banker. But again, Powell is a politician. He's no different. And uh, the Fed is a fourth branch of government, sadly. And you really have to watch what your dollar. As we talk about silver's growing demand, we can't ignore one of the biggest players in the global economy, China. China is both a major consumer and producer of silver, and its influence on the market is massive. 
Recently, China has been ramping up its fiscal and monetary stimulus, which should, in theory, boost industrial demand for silver, particularly in manufacturing and clean energy. However, there's a catch. China's manufacturing activity has shown signs of slowing down, which could restrain the growth in silver demand. Despite these challenges, China's commitment to its industrial sectors, especially in clean energy, continues to drive demand for silver. The country's push towards solar energy and electric vehicles still places it at the center of the global silver market. But with unpredictable manufacturing growth and potential slowdowns, how will this impact silver prices moving forward? This is where the global supply demand... And this misreported and this dishonest potential. and this devious and this ultimately inevitable is theft. It's theft. If, if you lose 20% of your purchasing power in a matter of a few years, that's palpable. And if your wages or social security checks or annuities in, real, in, in nominal terms are the same, but in real terms are losing, you are literally slipping backwards slowly at first, then as Hemingway described, poverty all at once. And the question is, um, and again, for the middle class, which has not enjoyed the benefit of the inflation and risk assets because the top 10% has enjoyed the, uh, the vast majority of the uh, S&P rise over the last many years, uh, the middle class will feel it the most, and that explains why the middle class is far more political and, and far more uh, polarized now than any time that I can remember as an American, whether I'm overseas or visiting. Um, and that's true everywhere where inflation becomes a problem. The truth is, inflation, even for politicians, is embarrassing, and they understand that, and that creates a lot of um, frustration. But ultimately, politicians don't want to talk about real inflation, so they misreport it by at least 50 percent. And they also talk about other things. They distract through bread and circus or through de 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 divisive policies or divisive distractions. Again, we've talked about this in the past. Transgender bathrooms are nearly as important as not be able to make your mortgage payment or to stay in your condo because of HOH fees or whatever. So these things are going to become more and more uh, powerful the, the, the question is, can it be fixed or is it even wanted to be fixed? Inflation cannot be fixed in one term or through one political fiat because we simply have no other way to purchase our own, our own IOUs other than to debase the money to pay for that. And that IOU, that U.S. Treasury and that debt is key to our survival. Now, let's talk about something that often flies under the radar, silver supply. While demand for silver is soaring, the supply side is facing significant constraints. Silver mine production has been stagnant for years, and it's expected to decline even further in the coming year. In fact, most silver is actually a byproduct of other mining activities, meaning only a small percentage of global mines are dedicated to silver itself. This creates a bottleneck that could send prices skyrocketing as demand continues to rise. But that's not all. Recycling is becoming an increasingly important piece of the puzzle. Recently, Stomex acquired JBR, one of the top companies in silver recycling, aiming to meet the growing global demand for recycled silver. This move signals just how tight the supply chain is becoming, with even major players needing to secure their own silver sources to keep up with demand. As the world transitions to more green technologies and industrial uses, this supply crunch could be the key factor that pushes silver prices to new heights. They will misreport inflation, but the sad reality is, unless we cut spending, unless we balance our, our balance sheet or you know fix our balance sheet or reduce our balance sheet as a government like you would as a family or in a company, unless we do that, we're going to have to consistently debase money to pay for our own survival as a nation. Well, that always on, is at the expense of the citizen. The politicians will somehow survive. The citizens won't. So what do they do? Again, they'll misreport inflation, or even worse, to Hemingway's point, they'll distract us in wars, in which case those are inherently inflationary as a society and in war, capital controls, yield controls, rationing becomes patriotic and you can blame it on, a, on, a, on an adversary rather than your own politicians. I hope that isn't what happens. The only other solution to inflation besides war would, again, 
be the uh, the cutting of spending, which is political suicide. You, you can't cut entitlements and you probably can't cut military by 40 to 50 percent, which is what we need to do. Or you can't let banks fail and not bail them out, which is what we need to do. So the kind of tough requirements necessary to avoid inflation are politically untenable at this point. And so that's why I'm not optimistic in any easy solution. Whoever's in the White House next, I almost have sympathy for, as I've joked before, it's like becoming the captain of the Titanic after the iceberg. Uh, It's going to certainly take more than four years, and it's going to take a population that's willing to suffer austerity for a greater good. They'll only do that if they trust the greater good, if they agree to the greater good, and if a leader will tell them that austerity is coming. The problem is you can't get elected by promising austerity. Whether you're talking about cutting taxes or whether you're talking about price controls, uh, left or right, red or blue, both of those are going to be highly inflationary anyway, and they're not going to solve the problem. So I think we're stuck in a corner now. I think, sadly, uh, I I don't have a good solution for the inflation, and I don't have a good solution for the debasement of our currency, which is historically, without exception, what always happens. Matthew Piebenberg, a leading expert in precious metals, has been following these trends closely and his insights paint a clear picture. The stars are aligning for a major silver rally. With rising geopolitical tensions, inflationary pressures, skyrocketing industrial demand from clean energy, and a tightening supply chain, silver is poised to break out like never before. Biebenberg believes this rally isn't just speculation. It's a matter of when, not if. Central banks are quietly stacking silver, anticipating the same shift. With inflation eroding the value of currencies worldwide and global instability driving safe haven demand, silver has the potential to surge well beyond dollar fifty per ounce, and for those who are prepared, the time to act is now. As these key factors converge, silver could soon outpace other investments. If you've been waiting on the sidelines, this might just be your last chance to secure your position before the market takes off. Remember, this isn't just about silver as a metal. It's about securing your financial future in a world of uncertainty. That's why 45 nations are trading outside of the U.S. dollar. These were considered sensational headlines when we warned about them, including Andy back in 2022. Everyone thought it was hype. De-dollarization is not going to make an edge. The the U.S. dollar is still king of liquidity. It's it's 85% of FX transactions. It's the key to the derivative markets. It's the key to the euro dollar markets. These are all true. But that doesn't change the fact that the dollar may be king in liquidity, but as a reserve asset, as a store of value, as a savings asset, the dollar is no longer king. Gold is king. That is not the bias of a gold bug, whether I'm in Switzerland or in the U.S., whether you're trading from London or you're in the New York or Comex or the LBMA. The BIS is telling us and the central banks in the East, which are buying gold at record levels and dumping U.S. treasuries at record levels, are telling us that they don't trust the U.S. Treasury as much as they do gold as a savings asset, as a reserve asset. And again, those who thought that that was a sensational comment about de-dollarization and the rise of the BRICS and the rise of trade settlements outside the dollar said it still can't replace the king dollar. I've never said it had to replace the dollar. The dollar's not going to be replaced. The yuan or the ruble or the rupee or the rial are not going to be the next reserve, world reserve currency. What it does mean, though, is the dollar won't be replaced. It's being repi- repriced. And we see that we see that consistently now. The fact that the COMEX is no longer having open positions, but they're taking actual delivery. The, the, the fact that there is less and less you know, segregated, allocated gold and silver for the COMEX banks or the LBMA banks to manipulate the gold price is not a coincidence because nations want their gold at home. They don't want it on these exchanges. They don't trust these exchanges. That gives those exchanges less power to manipulate the gold price. The repatriation of gold in 30 countries in the last year and a half is not a coincidence. Uh, the oil trade is not a coincidence. The more and more trades outside of the U.S. petrodollar are taking place every day, 20% less than they were the year before. These were unthinkable things. Even the Shanghai exchange is growing. You can't have a moving day average on the Shanghai exchange that is different than the U.S. than the other exchanges. So you're going to have to price gold more fairly. Shanghai has changed the changed the play, the chess pieces on the board. And finally, even the IMF, of which I'm no fan, and central bank digital currency, of which I'm no fan out here in Europe. Well, even their central bank digital currency to have credibility has to have some reconciliation with gold. They've said that. So all of these signs, which are way beyond just my conviction slash bias or Andy 